All right, confirmation students, this is our next section on the Lord's Prayer. You'll remember the Catechism is broken into three main parts. Four, if we add the sacraments and confession. We talk about the Ten Commandments, which we just finished doing, and which you still need to have memorized. It's not just something you drop. Also, the Apostles' Creed, which we'll actually do next as the kind of wrap-up to our study for 2014, spring 2014. And then finally, the Lord's Prayer. Now, if you remember, three questions get answered by the commandments, the creed, and the prayer. The com Ten Commandments are what we do, or what to do. So what does God want you to do? What kind of life does God want you to live? And the Ten Commandments give us a shape of the resurrected life in the kingdom of Jesus. The Apostles' Creed, the question is answered what to believe. So who is this God that calls us? And so we talk about God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We'll talk about creation, redemption, being made holy, sanctification. And then finally, the Lord's Prayer. What, or actually more perfectly, how to pray. What words to say, what ways to pray, but also how to pray. And so not only is this God knowable, but this God wants to have a relationship with you. The Lord's Prayer is actually a gift that Jesus gives to his friends. Now, his friends are also called the disciples. They're his students, the ones who are being tutored in his way. And they know that God wants them to be in relationship, and they have the desire for relationship, but they're not sure what to do with that desire. I mean, this is something you're experiencing as you're maturing and growing older. You'll have desires. You'll also have desire for a relationship, and you're not even sure what to do. Do I talk to that person? Do I call them? Do I text them? Do I like their Instagram? Whatever it is. Do you have a desire for relationship? And so Jesus knows that, because the disciples come to him, and they say, Lord, teach us. Teach us how to pray. We have this desire to connect with God. We have this desire to speak with God. But we don't know how. God is so different than we are. What are we supposed to do? And so they say, Lord, teach us how to pray. And Jesus doesn't say, no, I don't think so. Sorry, guys, that's secret knowledge. He doesn't say that. And he doesn't say, well, you know, I mean, I guess I could, well, just whatever. No, he says, all right, here's a prayer. When you pray, pray like this, and he gives them the Lord's Prayer. Sometimes people will say, oh, I don't pray because I don't know what to say. Or I'm not like a very religious person, so I'll leave that up to like someone who's a good theatrical prayer. No, Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus says, here's the prayer, now grow into it. And so this is the gift to you. Jesus gives you the gift that you can grow into across your whole life. It's not just something you memorize and put away. It's a gift you grow into that helps the desire for relationship with God to flower. Now let me give you a few notes just on prayer in general. All right? Now, prayer is not just talking. Talking is part of it, but not just talking. Sometimes people think, well, prayer is just talking to God, asking for things, and then I just go on my way. I mean, imagine having a relationship where you only talk and never listen. So prayer includes talking, but it also includes listening. And it doesn't just include your brain and imagination. It includes your whole body. So it includes your whole self. Sometimes our prayer is just falling on our knees. We don't have any words to say. Sometimes our prayer is just lifting up our eyes to the heavens. Sometimes it's a groan. Sometimes it's just sitting in silence and waiting. But it's bringing our whole body, our whole mind, our whole heart before the Lord. And so sometimes people find the life of prayer very fruitless because they're only just kind of talking in their brain or uh, kind of just indulging the thoughts of their heart and not ever leaving themselves. And um, we say, well, prayer's not for me. Nothing really happens. Let me give you this picture as an idea of what prayer can look like. This is a famous painting by the Austrian painter Gustav Klemt called The Kiss. Oftentimes, as you get older, if you go to university, uh, this is a very popular painting to hang in the dorm and so on. But you see, it's two people in an embrace, and it's two people um, having a kiss. And so this closeness, this intimacy, and this passionate love is the school of prayer. Meaning God is close to you. God feels passionately about you. You'll notice there's no speech happening, at least that we can see or hear, but the intimate embrace is communicating. 
And so I want you to expand your idea of what prayer is. I want you to expand your idea of what communication is. And I want you to think of it with the same delight and passion that you think of other relationships you're interested in. Maybe you, you're attracted to a person and you want to get close to them. And so part of confirmation and part of the Christian life is finding out that God is attractive. And God attracts us with his love. And then we enter into an important embrace. And it's very passionate. It's not boring. Uh, it's very passionate. And so part of this is just becoming aware of the passion that pursues us in the love of God. Okay, well, let's start talking about the prayer. The first words of the prayer are, Our Father... And that's where we're going to stop. We're only going to get two words into the prayer, and then we have to stop. And in fact, now we're going to spend some time just talking about the first word in the prayer. Look at that first word, our. Now, we know the word our is plural. Notice it's not my Father in heaven. Certainly, you can call God my Father, but the prayer is plural. For what reason? What do you think? Well, we never pray alone. I mean, even if you're sitting by yourself, you're never alone. Never prayer is alone. Sorry, that's kind of awkward. Never pray alone, or never prayer is alone. At the same time, we could say, all right, there are other Christians who are praying. There are other people who are praying. But it has to go even deeper than that. Even though other people are praying, why do we pray our Father? Well, think of the person who gives us the prayer. Who's the one that teaches the disciples to pray? It's Jesus. And so immediately we're talking about communion. Now this connects to what we have on the altar, but we're also talking about a kind of connection. When we pray our Father, you're praying the prayer with Jesus. Now let's go back to what we said when we mentioned the Creed, that Christians talk about God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in fact, the Christian life actually works backwards in our experience. So what happens is the Holy Spirit comes to us. The Holy Spirit is given to us as a gift. And if you remember, where does that happen? That happens in baptism. So you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit at baptism. But the Holy Spirit is always pointing back. To whom? To Jesus, the Son. So when we talk about baptism, we're talking about being united to Christ. We share in his death. We share in his life. And then the Son is always pointing beyond himself to the Father. So Jesus says in the Gospel of John, If you have seen me, you see the Father. So the idea is that your prayer life moves in this direction too. So that when you say, Our Father, you've entered God's own life as Holy Trinity. Through the Holy Spirit, to the Son, to the Father. Think of it like this. This is an icon of the Holy Trinity. When we talk about God being love, we're talking about a community of love. So the three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we don't even have to go through trying to explain to you why it is or how it works. Just receive it right now as a reality, and notice there's a place for you at the table. So part of prayer is you are welcome into God's own life. There's a place for you at the table, and God wants to hear you speak. And in fact, what you'll come to learn in your prayer life is that the Holy Spirit is within you, praying. So time, sometimes you won't know what to pray for, but the Holy Spirit will pray for you. The Holy Spirit will bring you to Jesus, who then brings you before the Father. And so when we say, Our Father, we're praying with other Christians with whom we're in communion. We kind of recognize that the body of Christ, the church, is the reality that we're a part of. And we recognize that we're united to Jesus through the Holy Spirit as we pray before the Father. And so this is very important, because this is the reality that we're talking about. We're not just talking about an idea. Well, what is prayer? And write that down. We're saying there's a fullness of love that God wants you to enter into. To give you another example, I'm not a very good artist, but I drew this. Imagine this is Jesus speaking to the Father. And all of the church is within Christ. This is what we mean, the body of Christ. Every Christian is part of this body through baptism, and together we speak our Father. And so the address points to the Father. And so those first two words are really key in understanding the reality of Christianity. When you say, Our Father, you are making a bold proclamation. Now we know the prayer continues in heaven. And really you can learn the prayer in two ways. If you look at your catechism, you'll notice that it's the translation that gets used in the church. 
And there's kind of a new way and an old way, and both ways are translated in your catechism, starting on page 15. So, obviously, most of you will learn the one we use in the church, uh, but there's a more contemporary version you can learn, too, which is fine. Our Father in Heaven. Now, let's talk about this phrase, in heaven. What or where is heaven? Well, in the old days, meaning in the ancient times, it was just kind of the idea that you went up and you encountered God. You know, sometimes it was like you would just go into the clouds, right? And we have this idea of God on the clouds. But we know, when we started flying airplanes and shooting rocket ships and satellites, that we went up and God wasn't just above us. And so heaven was less of a location, though I think we can speak of heaven, than it is a presence. What do I mean by that? What I mean is, where God is, is heaven. And you might say, well, that just seems like we're going in a circle. But it's true. Heaven is a relationship. Heaven's not just a place like, oh, hey, I went to Toledo. How was that? It was fine. Heaven is where God shows up, where God's reality is reality, where God's life is real, where the world is shaped in the way God desires. So when we hear visions of heaven, um, it's a place where God is present and where God's will is done. Now, if you want to think of it in a more complicated way, you can think of heaven as another dimension. So we can think about space and time and heaven as another dimension, uh, but we're not really going to get into that in confirmation. One other thing you can think about that is, when we say our Father in heaven, we're acknowledging that God is not the earth. God is not the sun. You know, there were people who used to worship the earth, worship nature and the sun and so on. And God was seen as distinct from those things. So it's not our Father in the trees, our Father in the sun, our Father in the stars. It's our Father in heaven, meaning this distinct location of God, uh, God is the creator. God is not the creation. Now, the other part that we can say with this is, all the way to heaven is heaven itself. This is an old saying in the church. And what I want you to understand is in your prayers, you can experience heaven now. Heaven is not just something for when we die. Heaven is a presence you can experience now with God. And you can experience it in some pretty awful places, you know, even in darkness and death. Uh, you can experience heaven because Jesus is there in the kingdom that he brings. And so already you can taste heaven. Already you can experience heaven as a foretaste, kind of a taste on the tongue. It's not the full reality, but it's not something totally foreign to you. And so part of this prayer is, wake up, heaven is here, because God is here. And God desires for you to have a place at the table and to speak. So our Father in heaven is communicating so much. I mean, sometimes... When you pray the Lord's Prayer, we pray it very fast. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom. Blah, 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 blah. Sometimes you can just stop and just pray each of the phrases, Our Father. And then you can sit with that for a few minutes, or you can say, Our Father in heaven, and sit with that for a few minutes. All right, the next phrase that we're going to talk about is the last one for this teaching video, Hallowed be your name. Now you'll hear about the petitions of the Lord's Prayer, of which there are seven. So this is the first petition. So we'll put seven petitions. And I think you guys know what a petition is, asking for something. Now, the word hallowed should be familiar from like Halloween. It means holy. And if you remember, holy means set apart. And it would appear that the rest of this is fairly straightforward, but we also want to talk about names. Now, God's name is holy, whether you want it to be or not. What you're asking for is, God, hallowed be your name among us. Set your name apart for me. Now, this is where we get into the name. The name of God, now we can say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, also reveals the character of God, how God acts, and who God is. To hallow God's name is to use God's name properly. And what I mean by that is to speak of God in a way that's real and authentic. Think of the commandment, you shall not misuse God's name. You will not say that God blesses things that God doesn't. You will not say that God curses things that God doesn't. So sometimes we say, I don't know why God did that. And occasionally you have to respond, well, I don't think God did do that. What is the character of this God? And the person who reveals the character of God is Jesus. So if we want to see who God really is, we look to Jesus, and Jesus reveals the face of the Father. Jesus reveals the breath of the Spirit. This is why Christianity is always coming back to Jesus. This always brings us back to those first words, Our Father. Jesus, let me be united to you in prayer. And let me speak to God with you. Hallowed be your name. You're creating space for God to work. Creating space for God to transform. 
Because here's the thing, we know that oftentimes we will misuse our lips, we will misuse our voices, we will misuse our bodies. And so now this is saying, God, make your name holy in my life. Create a space where you can transform things by your character, your character of mercy, your character of gentleness, your character of meekness, but a passionate and uncompromising love. Let that be in my life too. Holy be your name. And when God's name becomes holy, we kind of get set apart too. But in being set apart, we're not just put away on a shelf somewhere. Oh, look at that. He's set apart. Don't touch him. He's fragile. And being set apart, we actually enter the world more deeply. So that, in fact, we can be about God's work of loving transformation. All right now, some questions for you. So what are the three things we discuss in confirmation, just kind of to refresh your mind? What are the three things we're discussing in the catechism, and what questions do they answer? So we've already discussed the Ten Commandments, but what else is there? And what questions are they helping us answer for the Christian life? Why does Jesus give the Lord's Prayer? So what is the circumstance that the Lord's Prayer is given? And why might we describe the Lord's Prayer as something that teaches us? Or sometimes you hear the Lord's Prayer described as a school. What is the need that the Lord's Prayer is meeting? How do we participate in God's life? I mean, sometimes I think we just assume, well, you just do, you just show up. But no, that's not the Christian teaching. Christians have a very specific way that we participate in God's life. And so think about God's name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And how do we get connected to each, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? What does the phrase, Our Father in Heaven, mean? And you can talk about the Our, you can talk about the Father, you can talk about Heaven. You can talk about all three. And finally, what does hallowed be your name mean? So when we say hallowed be your name, what does that mean? What does it mean for God's name to find a special place in our lives? Well, this concludes our teaching video for the first part of the Lord's Prayer. We'll look forward to being together on Wednesday nights for praying together and conversation.